I'm so happy to be invited to uh, speak for the Friends of the National World War II Memorial again, and this time to address teachers. My parents are both teachers, so it's uh, kind of a return home and talk to people that uh, I enjoy hanging around with. And it combines two areas of interest because uh, I'm a big history nut, and uh, this whole project I think is going to help your students um, become much more interested in history. So the name of my organization is Stories Behind the Stars. Um, our purpose is to tell the stories of all 400,000 U.S. World War II fallen. Um, that's every one of them. That's kind of a big project, but as you uh, watch this presentation, I think you'll see that it's not really that daunting because we're getting uh, some great help, and I think you as teachers and your students can also join in this project. Um, it didn't start that way. It was originally just a one-man blog uh, back in 20. 16 during the 75th anniversary of uh, Pearl Harbor. I just started this as a, a one-man pastime and I would just on my lunch break write a story about one person. So I did that for more than four years and ended up uh, having uh, 1.5 million people read this um, stories that I did each day. But uh, it ended up growing to much more than that and now it's become a national effort. Not just one person but we have many more. At this point, we have 1,300 people from all 50 states and a dozen other countries that are helping out. 14 other countries, it says. There's, there's been a couple more since our last presentation that we did um, a couple months ago. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, this project, so I don't have to repeat stuff, you can go to uh, this link here on Vimeo. And this is my recording that, that, that I did for that presentation back in April. So this will give you a good general background about what this project is all about. So I'd recommend to learn more about our background to watch that video. We really have two goals in mind. First of all, as I mentioned before, we want to have a story for each of the 400,000 World War II fallen from the United States. But the next part, I think, is how we've been so successful at attracting people to help out. We want to be able to have people read these stories by scanning names off of a gravestone. So it's one thing to have it on a blog like I used to have or even on a website, maybe your school has a website to have that, or even a, a local city or county or an organization to have these um, where people can read them, but they're not at the best location where to have them. The best place is actually right at the place where that person is remembered, which would be their gravesite or their memorial. So the app's still under development. We have a working copy, but uh, in, in the end, what people will be able to do for all these 400,000 names is go to the Gravesite. So, in my example here, Harry W. Nelson, you'll be able to use the phone to just scan it. It's just going to read the characters right off of the stone, and the story you see on the right here will pop up. And so, we'd like to have your students contribute to these stories. And I think most of them have smartphones, and if they were to go to a grave, they could pop up and see the, the story that they wrote themselves. So, the the smartphone app is a little bit farther behind on this project, so it probably won't be right at this time when they're students, but eventually, a um, year or two down the road, they'll be saying, hey, I want to show you something, and they'll be able to show this story that they helped contribute to this project right at this person's gravesite. We have people of all ages that are helping out. Here's just a, some photos of some of our volunteers, and you can see that some of them are older, but we do have some younger ones. And during the question and answers, I've invited one of my teen volunteers to be with me to answer some questions so you can get a kind of perspective on um, how she's um, benefited and contributed with this project. The National World War II Memorial, as most of you are familiar with, has this Price of Freedom wall. There are 4,048 gold stars there. Each one of them represents 100 of the fallen. And the place we get the name for our project was kind of inspired by this. And the idea was, unlike the uh, Vietnam Memorial Wall where you can see the names, it, it just wouldn't have been possible when they built this memorial uh, more than a decade ago to have done that. Um, but now, and that was even done before the time we had smartphones, but now I foresee a time in the future. We plan to have this done by the 80th anniversary of the end of World War II in 2025. I think by that time we'll have enough resources that there'll be a separate smartphone app that you can go scan this uh, Price of Freedom wall and maybe each of these stars will break 
down into 100 smaller stars and each one of those will represent an individual story. So it could result in a much richer experience here at our prime World War II memorial uh, in the United States. So our goal is to give each uh, these stars a story and I'm going to spend the rest of the time showing you as teachers how you can instruct your t students to do this. We've created something we call Star Core Boot Camp. Star stands for storytelling and researching. And we provide free online resources to train our volunteers to write these stories. In the boot camp, we cover six main things. How to find a name. Uh, how do you find the research material once you've gotten that name? What you are going to include in the story? How do you write the story? We also have an element of quality review so that you don't have to feel like, I've never done this before. How can I make sure that it meets the standards of what we would expect? And then we also provide free access to some paid search sites that are super helpful in accessing and finding the information you need to write these stories. So I'm opening up another tab here that's going to show the boot camp. So this isn't quite the screen that you would see when you sign up. You do have to register. And I don't know if you'd want to have your students register or if just have your school register. There's no, no cost at all, uh, no uh, selling of any kind that's done on it. Uh, merely educational. So StarCrow Bootcamp, I press that button. Over here on the left is the table of contents. We're on the introduction page right here. And then we talk a little bit about the organization. In this section, we have a section on the mission of our project. And these are not really long um, sections, just enough to get the information on what you need. We have a little bit of overview on what's included. This uh, section here tells people how to find a name, has links to videos on how to do that. Um, once you found the name, you need to find out, well, where do you find the source material? So we have information on how to do that. Um, then we want to find out, well, what do you include in the story? So we talk about that element of the process. How do you write the story? We have information on how to do that, dividing it up into separate sections, so it's pretty consistent. Um, we're not asking the students to write something super complicated. They're basically writing an obituary in maybe 400,000 uh, words, which is well within the uh, writing abilities of most high school students. Um, we show how once you've written the story, well, what do you do with it now? How do you save it? Um, I mentioned before we want to make sure that everybody's story, their first one gets reviewed. So we, we have a limited number of reviewers, so it may be okay as you as teachers with your background in English and history that we'll just have you guys serve that review function for your students because I think you could get the gist of it just by seeing some examples of what we do. Um, here we explain how do you get access to our uh, VPN to get um, free uh, use of some of the uh, reg how you can get free uh, access to some of the uh, research tools that normally cost a subscription. Um, we talk about our Facebook group where people can go to ask questions of other uh, researchers. So super helpful. We've got these 1,300 people. We created that. So it's very much something that you can do on your own without having to have a lot of supervision or involvement because um, we're, we're, we have a lot of people volunteering, but it's mostly all volunteers. So uh, as much as people can do on their own, uh, we're trying to make that possible for them to do it that way. So these training videos, I, I touched on those a little bit when I was going through the boot camp. Um, very important, I wanted to stress this uh, so, so that you remember that, so you'll probably see it elsewhere as you get close to this. Um, we've done 8,000 names so far. There's 400,000 to go still. So it's unlikely that a name you will have selected for your students will be one of these 8,000 that we've already done. But it could happen. So we'd hate to have your students spend a few hours doing all the research and they get ready to add the story and it's already been done. So one of the videos that we ask people to do uh, as they're going through the boot camp is we have a, a video here called do this first how to confirm a name has no story so this four minute video will walk you through the process of just checking to make sure nobody else has already written a story 
so that uh, you're not repeating someone else's efforts. And we also have the other videos here that we've created. Um, the longest one is 14 minutes, but we try to keep them short enough to just cover the topic of what uh, people need to, to know, to know how to use that particular document we're talking about. So we have uh, online resources for research. Uh, this project couldn't have been done one or two generations ago because you, you'd have to go to a major library and even then it'd be incomplete. But assuming that you at your school or your students at home have access to the internet, uh, they'll be able to use the resources I've listed here plus others. And that's how you write these stories is by going and do the research at these locations. So let's talk about the first part of the boot camp, which was finding a name. Um, I think the best thing for your students to do is if there's a family member, it's probably going to be a great, great grandfather, great, great grand uncle, um, maybe a great, great grand cousin or something. Um, 400,000 people died in World War II. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if not, perhaps not all, all of your students in your class, but some of them may have a connection, a personal connection to someone who died during World War II. So if that's the case, they should probably do a, a story on that particular person. And they may have the resources and photos and other things to get the details that um, they don't need to use as much the online tools because they pers have that personal connection. So that might be the first choice, uh, a family member. Um, maybe they had a family member who came home from the war, but they were in a particular unit that they wanted research. So that might be another avenue they could go. Um, another idea is find someone who's buried there locally. Maybe in your school district, uh, close to your high school, there's a cemetery that has World War II fallen. You could go research on find a grave for that cemetery and see which one of them fall within the dates of having died in World War II. And then you could focus on them. And then when you're done with the stories, you could actually maybe make a field trip or encourage your students on their own time to go visit these grave sites so they have a more personal connection. Having been buried at home, maybe some of them went to the high school they're attending. If you happen to teach at a high school that's an older one that was still around in the 1940s, there may even be plaques in, in your high school that list the names of some of the World War II people that didn't come home that attended that high school. That might be another place that you could find names to write about. Um, this uh, picture I'm sharing here shows uh, the names of uh, some airmen who are buried at uh, Zachary Taylor National Cemetery here in Louisville, where I live. And I was just visiting you there the other day. I just took a picture here. This would be an easy way for you to have a group of students work together on, on one crew because a lot of the information is going to be similar. They were all on that last mission together, but it's separate enough on the front end of their pre-war story that they could work individually on those. So um, that's a, a great way to, to have group projects where some of your stronger writers can help some of your weaker writers in your classroom to still participate in this project. So one of the reasons we're doing this is if you go to this grave site, you see names, you see a rank, you see a date, and that's the most permanent remembrance we have of these individuals is just this few words carved in stone. Um, so we go over here to Thane's Find a Grave page. We can see when he was born, when he died, where he's buried, down to the plot number. We have a picture of him. Here's another picture. Here's a picture of his grave site. And in this case, we actually have quite a bit that someone has written about him. So all this information could be used to write a story about Thane Hecox. The other individual here, James Dubois, we also have a photo for him. We know when, where he was born, what day he was born. We don't have a story about him right here. So whoever were to, was to write about him may be able to share some of the information that they got from the Hecox Find a Grave profile. So that's what I would recommend as far as where finding a name was to follow those three uh, leads. Let's go to the next thing about finding the research material. So we're, we're, we're looking at six main sources. We've got census records. You can find an ancestry, findagrave.com, which you just saw uh, a couple of examples of, enlistment records, which are on ancestry, U.S. headstone applications, again on ancestry, news stories, which you can find at a site called newspapers.com 
also owned by Ancestry, and then online unit level military sites. So we've created a tip sheet that you'll see in bootcamp that you can share with your students. And it says where to find information to write stories. So the primary information is the kind of stuff you'd normally expect to see in an obituary. And so we've listed this along the left. When they write their stories, they're gonna to wanna to include the date of birth, where they were born, the name of their parents, where their parents are from, what did their father do for a living, what were their older brothers and sisters, how many years of schools they went, what did he do for a job before the war, where did he live before the war, um, enlistment date, when he joined the military, and the place you can find this is listed over here in the source. A lot of this you can get from the census. Some of it is find a grave or death certificates. Um, over here there's something called the Army Enlistment Record or a U.S. Headstone application. So your students can use this as a checklist to say, okay, I've got uh, the information on his pre-war occupation. I need to find out what his rank was. Well, where do I find that out? It's gonna be on his U.S. Headstone application. Um, I, then we go over to the section as far as where do you find information of what he was doing during the service. If you pick uh, someone who was um, in the Army Air Forces, um, you can Google the bomber group he was in or the fighter group he was in. You can go to the AmericanAirMuseum.com and find information. There may, you may be able to find information on newspapers.com. Another site called Scribd is a, is a good resource. And for Air Force, there's a link right there on a biblio uh, that has good good information. So a lot of detail here at different locations, um, but it's all pretty accessible from any computer. I'm, I'm sharing here just some of the online unit uh, websites that you can use. If you're gonna go the route of choosing a bomber group for your research, not all bomber groups have the same level of information online. Some of them have barely anything at all. So before you commit yourself to a bomber group, you may want to Google them and see what they have. Uh, everybody that's in the Army Air Forces is, is going to show up on this website here. Very information rich. You can use the browse option here to type in the name of anybody who is in the Army Air Forces and you got a pretty good chance of finding who that person was if they passed away. You can also find information on the aircraft they were in, sometimes the mission that they were in. So this is a very useful research site for the Army Air Forces. Now if you happen to find someone who's in the 384th Bomb Group and you were to Google that, you would end up with this page and it lets you do a personnel search by their first name and their last name. Lots of information here uh, on their missions, the aircraft, losses, lots of resources, a photo gallery. So again, this is one of the more complete bombardment group websites. I'm just going to share these two others. These are not standardized. It's just people probably who are descendants of people who were uh, in service in these units that have just had a passion to remember them. And so they've created these uh, web pages with lots of information. Here's one of the group pictures. Accident reports is very, very useful in trying to find out information about their final missions. So uh, great resource. And these are actually some of the easiest stories that we write are for the Army Air Forces. And if, if I were to try to tell your students, well, let's try to do research on Army divisions that were in New Guinea, that's going to be a lot more of a challenge because there just hasn't been the kind of uh, follow-up on, online with uh, documentation on how to do research for those. But for teenagers, I think it'd be awesome for them to be able to easily find this information so they feel encouraged to continue on with this project. On this page here, I want to talk a little bit about the VPN access. Um, while some of the sites, like the unit sites I shared with you, are free, um, accessing some of the major research sites like Ancestry or Newspapers or Fold3 do require a subscription to get full access. So a lot of people that like genealogy already have this, and a lot of schools sometimes have subscribed to this as an institution. So some of your students or families may have a membership already so that's good for them to use that or if your school has one then you already have access to use it that way but if neither one of those is an option you can contact me at stories behind the stars um, ancestry has been kind enough to make stories behind the stars a, a library kind of a online worldwide library and so we use a VPN 
that lets people log in from wherever they are to join this library we have set up and then you get access to this information. So it does cost us money to do that. It doesn't cost Ancestry anything. They're giving this to us for free. We have to pay like an average of about $24 per user. So it'd be best for us if the teachers are able, if they need to, to use it for your entire class because then our cost is only $24. And if you only plan on using it for say a month or so, you tell us, hey, I'm done using it. And then we, we log you off and we get someone else to uh, take on that particular uh, node in our VPN access. On this page, I want to show what to include. So those are the six areas that we focus on on the story. And I'm going to share an example to show how simple it really is for your students to do these stories. So we used all the resources that we found that we showed you earlier. This is the page on full three where the story was saved. Title here says Second Lieutenant George William Sharman killed in action over the English Channel on D-Day. And then the first paragraph is going to tell a little bit about his earliest background. Second Lieutenant George William Sharman shares his uh, service number there. Born on the 26th of October, 1921 in Reading, Berks, Pennsylvania. His father, Charles Winfred Sharman, and his mother, Edith Mary Maurer, were both born and raised in Berks County, Pennsylvania. His father was a machinist and a factory worker who later was a clerk for the WPA in Pennsylvania. Charles was the third of his parents' four children. He had an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. All that information we were able to find for that paragraph pretty much from the census data. Next paragraph is going to talk a little bit about when he's a bit older. George went to school in Reading, Pennsylvania, graduated from Reading High School in 1939. In high school, he showed an interest in flying and belonged to the Aviation Club for model plane building in high school. After graduation, he went to college for a year before working as a lathe operator and press steel worker in Reading, Pennsylvania. George received his draft card in February of 1942, and on June 11, 1942, he enlisted in the Army Air Corps in Pennsylvania. So again, that information was all found from the resource information, different sites that uh, I shared elsewhere in this presentation. Now we're going to talk a little bit in this paragraph about what his service was like for the first part of the war. He was first stationed at Langley Air Base in Virginia for basic pilot training on November 25, 1942. George married Reading, Pennsylvania native Mary Jane Shugart in Alexandria, Virginia. She was a defense worker making parachutes in Alexandria, Virginia at the time they met. By early 1944, George was a commissioned second lieutenant assigned to the 862nd Bombardment Squadron in the 4th 93rd Bombardment Group, heavy, and was stationed in McCook Army Airfield in Nebraska. On May 1st of 1944, he transferred to the DeBach Airfield in Woodridge, England. So we know what he was doing um, before he went overseas. In this case, our researcher was able to find information that he was married, even was able to find some information about what his spouse his background was like. The 493rd Bombardment Group was the last group to be formed in the 8th Air Force Group. The first mission of the 493rd Bombardment Group was to bomb roads and railroad crossings in France on June 6, 1944, D-Day. They were to be part of the 8th Air Force Group's almost 2,400 bombers that would be in airborne support of the Normandy landing. Second Lieutenant George William Sharman was the bombardier aboard a B-24H Liberator. That's the uh, tail number of the Liberator on what was his first combat mission. In the early morning of June 6, 1944, a group of 36 B-24 Liberators from the 862nd Bombardment Squadron took off for their target, a road and railroad crossing at Le Sieux, France. But the cloud cover was so heavy that the decision was made for the planes to return to Debach Airfield without dropping their bombs. As they were, as they were returning at 1028 hour at 11,000 feet above the English Channel, about five miles west of Guernsey Island, the right wing of B-24J Liberator, called No Love, No Nothing, struck the tail of the B-24H Liberator called Moby Dick. The No Love, No Nothing was seen to disintegrate and both planes disappeared into the low level clouds below. One or two parachutes were seen out of each plane, but neither the wreckage nor the bodies was ever found. Some report later claim 
there was a sole survivor from the B-24 Liberator who was captured and survived the war, but it was never substantiated. So a lot of good information there, what actually happened to our uh, bombardier. And that was probably taken from the uh, uh, accident report for the uh, 862nd Bombardment Squadron. There's probably a website for the uh, 493rd Bombardment Group, which is where our, our researcher found that. So now we've covered everything. We're just going to kind of wrap things up what happened after that. Since his remains were never found, 2nd Lieutenant George W. Sharman's name is on the Tablet of the Missing at the Brittany American Cemetery in St. Jean's, Normandy, France. He was survived by his widow, who later remarried to a World War II Army Sergeant and Pennsylvania native, Harold Herber. George is also survived by his father, his mother, and his three siblings. And at the bottom, we ask our researchers to list their sources. And I'm, I'm sure as, as uh, high school teachers, you're good at getting your students to include their sources. But this is how we know what information people can look at if they want to find more details about uh, Lieutenant Sharman. Uh, census records were here. They got some town records. They found a yearbook, marriage records, draft cards. Um, there's a find a grave index, headstone records, uh, veterans compensation files. Uh, here's something from the US World War II fallen Korean vets from overseas. Fold three, find a grave, a place called database memoir, American Air Museum. All of this information helped this writer write that story. And then at the very bottom, we just have a standard paragraph that we write that uh, is a way for us to track all the stories that are being written for stories behind the stars. So, not too overwhelming, I think, for a high school student that could write something like this. I think a lot of them write, have to write papers much longer than this. So I think this could be a, a fantastic uh, project for those that are inclined to want to learn something more in this area. So there you go. That's what to include in one of our uh, Stories Behind the Star stories. Another resource that you can use, uh, and this might inspire your uh, students to learn more about the subject is we have this podcast we started a couple of months ago where we interview many of our uh, writers. Um, don't think we've had any students we've interviewed yet, but uh, if, they, if they listen to this, they'll get some research tips. It's probably this, the teachers that might want to listen to this more than the students. But you can find uh, the, the podcast here um, usually under 30 minutes. So Good, good details on if you're going to write stories, here's some tips from some actual writers and they share some of the cool stories. So you may even want to listen and share those segments with your students. Say, listen to what we found out from this person here because there's some amazing stories that would not be known if people had not joined this project. Another uh, tool that you can use, and I, I mentioned this in passing when we were doing the uh, boot camp overview, we have a Facebook group that you're welcome to join. And if you have questions you want to ask, we now have 400 people on here that are providing uh, questions and answers for each other. So down over here, I just saw one today. We had um, this individual here, Matthew Guimont. He's actually in France. He says, I'd like to know if a serviceman who died non-battle in 1942, 43, and 44 were posthumously awarded the World War II Victory Medal. And so he doesn't know the answer to that. Um, but looks like we had a couple people that did, so they were able to answer them there. So any question you may have that you need help with that's maybe a little bit beyond your expertise, you can go to our, our Facebook group, ask one of our writers, and don't be surprised if you'll get uh, two or three answers. So that's a great resource to help you and your students write stories. We do have a couple of upcoming projects if you want to specialize and, and focus your um, work in these areas. We are going to do the stories of every World War II American fallen buried at Arlington National Cemetery. It's kind of interesting. There's, there's 300,000 plus people buried here. And I uh, contacted the cemetery saying, can you just give me a list of the ones who were from World War II that died during the war and are buried there? And, and they told me, sorry, we don't have it. And I didn't believe them at first. I thought, well, maybe they just don't know who I am. So they just don't want to go to the effort to do that. But I. I tried through my congressman's office and my senator's office, and, and they confirmed that we, they just don't have that information. So with the help of Find a Grave, an ancestry subsidiary, I was able to find the information for that. So we're kind of building that database ourselves. There's about 6,000 
of these names that we need to do research for. And if you wanted to involve your students in taking on some of those names, and some of those are uh, Air Force, we could definitely use your help there. Um, our second project, oh, and, and with that project, our goal is to be done by uh, Memorial Day of 2022. So if, if some of your classes don't meet until uh, into the first part of next year, that project will still be ongoing and you can help us with that. Uh, the other project we're starting, and we're launching both of these on July 7th, um, so I think by the time you watch this, they will have already been started, is Pearl Harbor. There were 2,335 uh, servicemen and women who died during the Pearl Harbor attack. The 80th anniversary is this December 7th, so we plan to have this done by the end of, uh, um, by, by that date and probably before. Um, if, you, if your students want to participate in that, uh, that would be great. Um, picture you see here is actually the wall that's on the USS Arizona Memorial and right now it's kind of a sobering experience to go there and see all these names of I think it's about 1100 fallen who are on the Arizona and that's been the limit to the experience until now because when our phone app is ready you'll be able to scan any of those names and read their story that'll be super cool so on this page you'll see someone that I'm sure your students will recognize Tony Stark fallen here right from the Avengers um, Avengers are super, super popular with teenagers, and even, even me, 60-year-old, I like watching uh, Marvel movies too. But one thing that uh, we need to remember is these fallen heroes, they're just make-believe. They're just based on comic books, and they make for great stories and touching to, to see the sacrifices they're making. But in the end, it's just uh, a made-up story. But there are stories who are of, there are fallen heroes that are real that aren't make-believe. And this is something that your students can help uh, share with everyone who visits your gravesite or finds other ways to access these stories. These individuals here, um, each one of them died during World War II. And until this project came about, if you were to Google their name, pretty much wouldn't find much on them because the information is scattered in so many different places. But thanks to the volunteers who wrote these stories, each one of these people have a story. And, and your students could help us to remember more of these real heroes if they participate. And the purpose, as I shared before, is we want future Memorial Days to be an experience where instead of just going out and seeing a flag next to somebody's headstone and say, oh, they must be service because they have a flag. If you were to go to one and notice, look at the date. They died during World War II. You could pull out the smartphone app and read the story. And it could be a story that was written by one of your students. Um, the app doesn't cut off a of World War II. It's just that's where we have the stories written. So eventually, others, if they want to, can take on uh, what we started with Stories Behind the Stars and build it out so that they get stories for Korea or Vietnam or any of the more modern conflicts. There's no reason why part of remembering our military heroes shouldn't be just limited to just looking at a gravestone and, and seeing just what you see before you. Um, it's going to be possible very soon to be able to use this app to make it a much richer experience. So every fallen deserves a story. I hope that uh, you've learned something from this and were able to contact me if you want to get your students involved. And I want to give a thanks to the friends of the National World War II Memorial for inviting me to talk to you teachers. And I guess uh, we'll now open the time for questions.